Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday, the weekly YouTube series where we talk about video game console repairs, mods, and restorations. And this week we have the Nintendo Sharp Twin Famicom. So this is a version of the Japanese Nintendo Entertainment System. So in Japan, the NES is known as the Famicom, and uh, you can see that these are the controllers which are wired to the back of the console, which is a little bit different from what we have here in the United States. And what's really nice about this particular unit is that it allows you to play regular Famicom games here. And then it also has a floppy disk uh, port here. This is for the Famicom Disk System games. So a lot of people don't know that some of the real all-time classics like The uh, Legend of Zelda and Metroid, they first were released as a disk system version. Um, so there are a couple other nice things about this hardware. So it also has uh, composite video over here in addition to RF. And um, it's all in a single package instead of having, you know, two different units, which would be the Famicom Disk System and the Famicom. So uh, these are pretty, you know, nice to have. And so this one here is working, but what we're going to do today is we're going to improve the uh, video quality significantly. So what I'm going to do is something called an RGB mod, which uh, taps into the picture processing unit chip and uh, takes the... Uh, output from that and turns it into RGB and then from there I'm also going to add on something that allows uh, that RGB to be turned into component video and component video is something you can find on a lot of TV sets um, and so that's going to significantly improve the video quality coming out of this system. Alright so let's get started. Disassembly of a Sharp Twin Famicom is actually pretty simple. Um, what you got to do first is just get a Phillips screwdriver and go to all of these various points and remove the screws and uh, there are these very long kind of screws like you see here. I think there's about seven of them. So once those are out you can lift up the lid but you got to be kind of careful when you pull it up because there's a cable connected. So you can see here there's a cable that goes um, to this LED or yeah I'm actually not entirely sure I think it's an LED. But yeah you have to disconnect that like so, in order to separate the top case from the bottom. And uh, now what you see basically is that you've got three boards here. So you've got this board here, this is the Famicom. You've got this one which does power and some video connections. And then you've got the uh, Famicom disk system. And I actually had already fixed this a while ago, so, um, so this is a totally working unit now. Um, all right, so, so basically from here what you need to do is just disconnect all the various cables we're going to take out this um, board and we're going to be working with this for most of the rest of the time here. Alright, so now that that's out, this is the uh, Famicom uh, main board and you can see that's way way more compact than the one that we are used to with the North American NES front loader. Uh, so you can see that there's this large metal heat sink here. This is actually the PPU or the picture processing unit. So this is a chip that we need to remove and um, what I do to remove chips like this is kind of three different steps. The first step is going to be adding solder to all of these solder points and there's 40 of them. The second step is then to use my desoldering gun to remove this combination of old and new solder. And then the final step is to use a heat gun to help loosen up the last little pieces of solder that keep um, the chip stuck to the board. And, uh, and then from there you can just kind of pry it off very neatly and cleanly without causing any damage to the board. So you know, this is a, a really tricky, this is the hardest step in doing an RGB mod on a Nintendo um, because it's, it's very easily to damage traces or potentially damage the chip and so um, if you follow those three steps you significantly improve your chances of success. Okay, so we're going to start off by adding some flux to these 40 pins over here and the next thing we're going to be doing is adding some fresh solder to all the pins. This is a really important step because it makes it a lot easier to remove the solder when you add some fresh. It just kind of mixes with the old stuff and makes it a lot easier to uh, to take it all out. 
And it's okay if you bridge pins, you know, it's okay to be a little sloppy here because really the goal is just to add a lot of solder to all of these pins. And then we're gonna come back with the desoldering gun and we're gonna try to clear out all of this stuff if we can. Okay, so now we're gonna come in with the soldering gun, desoldering gun, and try to get everything out. So what I do is I bring it down, I kind of circle it a little bit. get it all out. Okay, so now we're ready for the third and final part of removing the PPU, and that is using the heat gun. So the way things are right now, most of the solder was removed by the uh, desoldering gun. But there's still going to be a little bit left, so if I tried to remove this with force, I'd probably end up ripping some traces and doing damage. So to avoid that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a heat gun, and I'm just going to kind of pass it over the entire chip. And at the same time, I'm going to have a flat tip screwdriver that's just going to be underneath over here, kind of putting a little bit of pressure on the chip. And hopefully what ends up happening is that it gets, as the solder melts, it's going to loosen up, and it's going to allow me to slowly pull the chip down without causing any damage to it. You'll notice that I also have some um, aluminum foil here on this uh, plastic part. That's just to protect it from the heat because I don't want to melt or damage any plastic parts with the heat gun. Okay, so I've heated up the gun, or I'm heating it up right now, and it, it's at 300 degrees Celsius, so that's not that hot for um, melting solder. I just have to figure out how to do this with my... <laughs> two hands. Not the easiest thing in the world, I can tell you that. Alright, so I want to get my... See, you just kind of go around it in circles. And that's it. All done. All right, so I just kind of wanted to take a brief moment and show you guys how everything looks when it's all done. Um, so you can see when you look at the chip that all of the pins are straight and they're all very clean. There's no solder on them uh, anymore at this point. And then this is what the socket should look like. And you can see all 40 pins are, are nice and clean. There's no uh, damage to the traces and the pads. They all look okay. And then if you flip it over, this is the other side, and you can see that the exact same thing has happened on the other side. So, you know, at the end, you should really try to see something like this, and, um, and just inspect your work, and then clean everything up with some alcohol if you need to. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and start soldering everything together and assembling the actual RGB kit. So what's interesting about doing this on a Sharp Twin Famicom is that you actually create uh, the mod board and connect it up on the underside of the motherboard. So we're going to start with the socket here and I'm going to just flip it over and we're going to solder it in place uh, from the top instead of from the bottom which is how you normally do things. So whenever I'm doing a socket what I do is I make sure I have even pressure pushing onto the socket and then I just solder the four corners first. Make sure that they're locked in. Okay. So now all the four corners are locked in, and I want to just flip it over again and just make sure that, yeah, everything looks like it's nice and level. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to go ahead and proceed and solder the remaining 30-some-odd uh, pins. OK, 
Okay, that's that. I'll just double check these off camera, but everything looks like it's in good shape now. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna add this little adapter board to the socket that we've soldered in. And first thing you gotta do is just lock down the four corners. And so basically what I did was I took a um, double-sided row of connectors that comes with the kit and inserted it into that socket that was on the motherboard. And then from there, we're just gonna lock it down in these four corners. Okay, so that's looking straight. So now that that's done, and I don't have to hold anything down anymore, I'm just gonna go along the row and solder all the remaining connections. Okay, that's all set. Okay, so we have the NES RGB board here, and now we're going to solder in a set of um, pins so that this will connect up to that adapter board I just made. And basically we're gonna do the same thing we did before. We're just gonna hold it down like this, and we're gonna solder the four corners, and you know the drill. Okay, so after all of that soldering, I've got everything now finished. So here's the PPU, and um, it has like a little indentation over here to indicate that this is the front. And normally you don't have this heat sink if you're talking about another type of uh, Nintendo, but in this case for this Sharp, it has this heat sink. So I've installed that, I've soldered the adapter board to it, and all of the various sockets. So we're almost done here. Um, I also have this component video adapter board too. So the last thing that we need to do is we need to solder two jumpers. There's this J3 jumper, this is for power, and then hidden underneath here there's a J5 jumper and that's for NTSC instead of PAL. So if it's NTSC Japan or North America, you've got to solder that. Um, so I'm going to try my best to do that one. It's a little bit difficult because it's underneath and I should have really done it beforehand, but I didn't realize exactly where it was located. But you know, soldering a jumper is normally not that tough. You just kind of put a big blob of solder on the two points and fuse them together. So that one's done. Now let me see if I can sneak my iron underneath and get this guy done too. big blob. Now of course you guys can't see that here, but I can see that looking at an angle. Um, Alright, so so yeah, the whole board is finished, and now basically the final step is going to be to make all the various connections here and here um, to uh, the sockets. Alright, so I have completed all of the wiring, and I kind of just want to show you guys what I did here. So this jack here is for component video so it basically has four different um, connections that it makes and and you basically use one of these these jacks here so it goes in and then you get Y, P, B, and PR for a component video and so I labeled those with the matching colored wires and basically you get PB 
and PR and ground up here. And then Y, which is um, also known as Luma, is, is coming from uh, over here on the board where it says Y. So that's the video. For the audio, what I did was I took um, audio from pins one and two of the CPU and I brought them in to these ports here, these little pads for um, A and B. And then this output pad, which is um, right up here, is audio out. So that's this brown wire over here. And I have that going between both sides here so that you have dual mono coming out of two um, uh, uh, of those audio jacks. And then black here, that's ground. So, so basically that's all of the wiring. And what I um, decided to do was instead of drilling holes into the case, I figured out a way that I can um, take these ports and put them on the outside without doing any kind of modifications to the case. So I'll show you that in a minute. Um, what I did was uh, I took this part of the board out. So this is the back port and it's where the power comes in. And then uh, composite video and audio used to come out of some jacks here. Those were all rusted up and kind of ugly looking anyway. So I got rid of those, I just desoldered them. Um, the original power jack was also very beaten up so I soldered in a replacement as well. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically panel mount those two jacks um, onto the side of the plastic and they'll fit right over here where the, um, the original composite video and audio jacks used to be. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and try to assemble everything and let's see how this thing uh, works. All right, so I have assembled the Sharp Twin Famicom and everything is looking pretty awesome now. So um, this is what component video looks like. And um, since I had the time, I also decided to make a few other modifications to this system as well. And I'll show you what I mean when we go to the back of this unit here. So um, you can see that there's actually a couple of different ports. There's this used to be the composite video and audio ports, and so that's what I'm using for component video and, and then component audio over here. But then there's also this 8-pin DIN connector over here, and what I decided to do was use that for both composite video and RGB. So this system has three different modes, and uh, I'll show all of them to you, and you can take a look at how big of a change in quality there is between composite and component and RGB. Okay, so here we have composite video, and so you can see, you know, things are much blurrier and uh, just generally messier. And then if I go ahead and just quickly switch over to component, you'll see that there is a very, very significant difference. So things are looking extremely sharp and crisp with component video. And there really isn't any kind of difference between RGB and component. All right guys, so that's about enough for this particular mod. I think it's really outstanding and it gives you the most you can possibly get out of a Sharp Twin Famicom. Um, if you like this content, you know what to do. Hit a thumbs up and uh, definitely subscribe to the channel because we'll continue to have more content like this uh, every week. And um, thanks again for watching and I'll see you guys again next time. Bye.